Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. Boy, you know that you are owning a news cycle when the title of the podcast is which of your two announcements was the bigger deal. Yesterday I tweeted, an O3 Pro that's more agentically capable, an 80% cost reduction in existing O3, a massive acquisition light that could reshape competitive dynamics regarding data, multiple multi-billion dollar fundraises, a viral singularity prognostication, and a huge debate on reasoning, and it's barely Wednesday. Yes, of course, based on the inscrutable and immutable laws of the universe, when I am traveling, it has to be the biggest week in AI we've had in some time. Luckily for all of us, I've got all the equipment on the road, and we are going to dig into this. In a surprise announcement, yesterday Sam Altman tweeted, We dropped the price of O3 by 80%. Excited to see what people will do with it now. Think you'll also be happy with O3 Pro pricing for the performance. A couple of hours later, the official OpenAI account confirmed OpenAI O3 Pro today. And so these are, of course, the two big stories that we're going to focus on in this main episode. A highly performant new model that, spoiler alert, seems even more tuned for the agentic era that we're moving into. And a massive cost reduction that could have significant implications for what people build. So let's talk first about this price reduction. Chubby at Kimonismus summed up many people's feelings when they tweeted, this is the real revolution. With a chart of the 87% price reduction between O3 Pro and O1 Pro. Now, keep in mind, this is not even the 80% reduction that we were talking about with O3. This is just the base cost of O3 Pro as it came out as compared to where O1 Pro was just a few months ago. But in terms of that big O3 price drop, many people could hardly believe it. Now, the specifics here were that it went from $40 per million output tokens to just $8. And on top of that, they also announced that they were going to double the rate limits for O3 for plus users. Now, this led many to assume that this must be a distilled version of the model. Not so, said Adam, who does go to market at OpenAI. He tweeted in response, it's not distilled, same model. When someone said, is it quantized though? Adam responded, it's the same model, full stop. And when someone asked, then how was it done? Were there major improvements on the software side of things? Is this because of increased resources? Or did nothing change and you can just incur the cost now? Adam responded to that one, As my teenage daughters would say, the inference engineers ate. Basically then, it seems like these are actual efficiency gains, not just competitive pressure and a bigger balance sheet. You'll remember that OpenAI also has jumped from 5.5 billion in ARR at the end of last year, all the way to 10 billion now. Now the claim here at least is that this is actual technical improvement. What's more, OpenAI researcher Noam Brown reinforced that businesses need to be skating to where the puck is going in terms of cost, posting, Input is now $2 per 1 million and output is now $8 per 1 million. The cost versus intelligence curve will continue to improve rapidly. Some people, though, despite the protestations of OpenAI staffers, think that this is at least a little bit about competitive pressure. Lisan al Ghaib, who featured prominently in our breakdown of the Apple intelligence report from yesterday, tweeted, Gemini 2.5 Pro and Sonnet might actually be forcing OpenAI to lower their ridiculous O3 prices. However, others were just excited. Edwin Arvis writes, O3 is 20% cheaper than GPT-4.0. Rethink everything. Bindu Reddy celebrated the competition, saying O3 price just dropped by 80%. This makes it less expensive than Sonnet 4. Finally, we have choice. Now, not to be petty here, but I do for just one moment want to bring things back to almost exactly a year ago. You might remember that as summer was taking hold in 2024, people were getting a little bit bored, and we had a whole slate of articles that wanted to discuss how AI was never going to pay back the big investment that was going on in it. Now, some part of that conversation was CapEx and Wall Street valuations, all things that I said were firmly in the realm of investors to decide how they should value things. But you might remember that there was one part of a Goldman Sachs report that really ground my gears. Their report was called Gen AI, Too Much Spend, Too Little Benefit. And while if you go back and listen to the show, I'm actually arguing that the report is not nearly as negative as the title suggests. One person who was very negative was Goldman Sachs head of global equity research, Jim Covello. One thing that was particularly notable to me, and I called out then, was that when the interviewer asked, even if AI technology is expensive today, isn't it often the case that technology costs decline dramatically as the technology evolves? Jim first argued that that's revisionist history, but he also said even beyond that misconception, the tech world is too complacent in its assumption that AI costs will decline substantially over time. Moore's law and chips that enable the smaller, faster, cheaper paradigm driving the history of technology innovation only proved true because competitors to Intel like AMD forced Intel and others to reduce costs and innovate over time to remain competitive. 
The starting point for costs, he continued, is also so high that even if costs decline, they would have to do so dramatically to make automating tasks with AI affordable. And so obviously, I think you know where I'm heading here. In three months, we have seen an 80% decline in arguably the most performant model, at least the most performant model when it comes to many agentic use cases. Not only is that a faster price decline than Jim predicted, it's faster than anything that anyone predicted. Simply put, whether you are skeptical of AI in general or not, cost will not be the constraining factor in how much impact it has. But what about this new model O3 Pro? If you are a regular listener, you'll know that I am a huge fan of O3. It is my default model for a huge amount of the sort of business strategy and ideation type of use cases that are my day in and day out. And so I, even more than most, have a particular interest in digging in deep around O3 Pro. That said, I have only just barely scratched the surface. I'm planning on doing a top five use case type of show later in the week, and I'm still learning exactly what O3 Pro is really good for as compared to O3, but in the meantime, we do have some folks who have spent time with the models who shared some really interesting thoughts. The most notable of these comes from AI entrepreneur Ben Hylak, who wrote a guest post for Latent Space. The piece, by the way, has the phenomenal title of God is Hungry for Context, but here's how Ben summed up his time with O3 Pro. He said, the problem with evaluating O3 Pro it's smarter, much smarter. But in order to see that, you need to give it a lot more context. There was no simple tester question I could ask that blew me away. But then I took a different approach. My co-founder Alexis and I took the time to assemble a history of all of our past planning meetings at Raindrop, all of our goals, even recorded voice memos, and then asked O3 Pro to come up with a plan. We were blown away. It spit out the exact kind of concrete plan and analysis I've always wanted an LLM to create complete with target metrics, timelines, what to prioritize, and strict instructions on what to absolutely cut. But the plan O3 Pro gave us was specific and rooted enough that it actually changed how we are thinking about our future. This, Ben points out, is hard to capture in an eval. Now, this is hugely resonant for me. I can, in very simple language, describe how different it is to talk about business strategy and ideas with O3 as compared to, for example, 4.0 or 4.5. But it's huge. It is incalculable. There is, in most situations, very little of value when sharing and trying to get feedback on an idea or processing a particular business problem when just chatting with 4.0 and 4.5. O3, on the other hand, is so frequently useful, if not for its blistering insight, then for different things like the way that it structures thinking through the answer to a particular problem, that it's very rare that when I'm brainstorming or ideating or thinking about something, I don't have a sort of ongoing dialogue with some combination of O3 raw and deep research with O3. And it sounds like from what Ben is arguing in this piece, that the glow up and change between O3 and O3 Pro might even be more significant. It seems to resonate with Sam Altman, who tweeted that particular quote about how it changed how they're thinking about their future. Now, the other thing that I think is really important to note about Ben's review of O3 Pro and something which relates directly back to the conversation we were having earlier this week about the Apple paper and whether and in what ways it mattered or not, is that O3 Pro's power is a real-world contextual power. It's about application and interaction with the real world, not just raw power in the lab. Ben writes, trying out O3 Pro made me realize that models today are so good in isolation we're running out of simple tests. The real challenge is integrating them into society. It's almost like a really high IQ 12-year-old going to college. They might be smart, but they're not a useful employee if they can't integrate. Today, this integration primarily comes down to tool calls, how well the model collaborates with humans, external data, and other AIs. It's a great thinker, but it's got to grow into being a great doer. O3 Pro makes real jumps here. It's noticeably better at discerning what its environment is, accurately communicating what tools it has access to, when to ask questions about the outside world rather than pretending it has the information or access, and choosing the right tool for the job. In other words, this is a model that is meant to be in the real world with real context. He even says that on the flip side, its big shortcoming is that if you don't give it enough context, which could be anything from meeting notes to call transcripts to PDFs to you name it, he says it tends to overthink. Quote, it's insanely good at analyzing, amazing at using tools to do things, not so good at doing things directly itself. I think it would be a fantastic orchestrator. Now, as an example of that type of overthinking and why it's so important with new models to figure out what use cases they open up and what use cases they're good for, is that investor Eric Wall demonstrated the other case. He pitted O3 against O3 Pro in selecting a group of animals to defend the user against the rest of the menagerie. 
There were selections like 50 eagles, 10,000 rats, 5 gorillas, and a single human rifleman to give you an idea of what we're dealing with here. After making their choice, the models then argue against each other to determine the winner. Wall writes, O3 Pro lost to O3 in this test despite thinking for 10 minutes. O3 thought for 25 seconds. Interestingly, more telling was O3 Pro's explanation of why it lost. The model wrote, Thinking longer is only an advantage when the extra cycles surface new decisive information. Here, they mostly amplified a hidden assumption and buried the robustness check. The lighter model's quick heuristic, minimize single point of failure, maximize coverage, was enough to nail the best answer faster. The point is once again that context is everything. If O3 Pro doesn't have enough context to chew on, it will actually use the extra inference to confuse itself by overthinking. Now for a somewhat more substantive evaluation, one of the few sets of evals that aren't totally washed at this point is the ARC AGI tests. Now on this test, the TLDR basically of it is that O3 Pro is performing pretty much in line with O3 on ARC AGI 1, but for a much higher cost. However, what's worth noting is that ARC has intentionally started to limit the inference deployed against their tests as they're looking for sparks of AGI at the consumer level. This means that O3 Pro probably isn't performing at the level you would use it in in high-value tasks during this testing. So what does this all mean for O3 Pro? I'm not sure yet, but my strong guess is that if Ben's right and that the real majesty of this model is in how it understands context and uses tools, it's going to take just a little while for us to really understand when you should be using O3 Pro and for what, as opposed to O3 or a different model. I am going to myself surely take some time, even though I'm traveling this week, to try to suss that out, and I will be back here to share what I've learned later in the week. For now, a very exciting day with big implications for the long term. As to this question of which of these is a bigger deal, the short answer is that they both are in totally different ways. They both show how things are trending in totally different aspects. Model capabilities and practical utility even more continue to increase, costs continue to decrease. The net of all of that is a straight line to intelligence too cheap to meter and incredible new capabilities for all of us to deploy. For now, though, that is going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Until next time, peace.